It's time for Security Now. Steve Gibson is here with the answer to some critical questions. Why are Firefox and Chrome blocking port 10,080? Hmm? <laughs> we'll also talk about uh, Flock, Google's federated learning of cohorts technology. It's starting to roll out now. And he has a good way of figuring out if you're in the Flock. And then it's a look at Pwned Own, some fun exploits, some not-so-fun problems. It's all coming up next on Security Now. Podcasts you love from people you trust. This, this is Twit. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 814, recorded Tuesday, April 13th, 2021. Pwn it and own it. Security Now is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get the password manager that offers a robust and cost-effective solution that could dramatically increase your chances of staying safe online. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan or try it free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. And by Thinkst Canary. Detect attackers on your network while avoiding irritating false alarms. Get the alerts that matter. For 10% off and a 60-day money-back guarantee, go to canary.tools slash twit and enter the code twit in the How Did You Hear About Us box. And by Worldwide Technology and Cisco. When was the last time your company updated your security strategy? Are your business assets protected? WWT combines strategy and execution to secure your organization and drive business outcomes. Visit wwt.com slash twit to get started. It's time for Security Now, the show where we get together with uh, this guy right here, Steve Gibson, every week and talk about your security and privacy online. Okay, I'm looking <laughs> I'm looking at this salute, the Vulcan salute. There's something different. I'm trying to figure out what it is about that ring finger of yours. What's going on, Steve? Uh, looks a little bit like yours, actually. It Lynn. does. Uh, yeah. There's a band of gold on it. Yeah, uh, after three and a half years of Lori being very patient, I decided that uh, she'd been patient enough. Actually, about a month ago, we we decided that we were going to make it official. And, you know, she's so much more than a girlfriend. Uh, at one point, she said, so what am I, your girlfriend? I thought, yeah, yeah that's just, that's not at right. At our age, no. girlfriend... <laughs> Doesn't really say yeah. it, does it? Yeah. <laughs> and if you say, "Oh, my partner," then they're like, "Well, yeah. okay, what's are the you gay?" Of this partnership. Yeah, exactly. So forth. Yeah. You know, and wife. Wife has a certain. Everybody understands what a wife is. It's a certain. It's ring a done to deal. It. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It is a four-letter word, but it's also a good one. Good. So, good. Good. Congratulations. Uh, anyway, we uh, we made it official last Wednesday afternoon. Uh, just a very quiet little ceremony. Yeah. We actually, we actually ordained her son with a universal life oh, church. That's perfect. Where you click, you click ordain me. Yeah, I on have the that. Website. I have that. Yeah, <laughs> and you're legal. Yeah. yeah, and and she wrote our vows. Oh, which, nice. Uh, which your son read, and we and we did our best to repeat. And oh, it that's was really, great. Oh, that's and, really no, great. And, you know, just kept it quiet to ourselves, and so it feels. Really good, and uh, here I am. Uh, what five days in, and yeah. not a regret, no married doubt man. Or anything, That's so. very nice. That's really yeah. great. Yeah, congratulations. She's great too, by the way. We've met, and uh, I give her I gave her my seal of approval yeah, some time she ago. She is uh, well. It and I told a story. I, I posted the news over on the news groups, and I said that you know, but at th this time of your life, by this point. You know, you've probably pretty much figured out who you are. And so on our first date, she asked me what was one of her like test questions. And she said, what are your plans for retirement? And I thought, you know, let's just, you know, no reason to soft pedal this. Let's just rip the bandage right off. If this is going to be the first and last date, then better to know now. So I said... Oh, I'm never going to retire. <laughs> Which turned out to be the right, the right answer. answer. Good. It's a you good know, answer for I, me too, by the way, Steve. I just want to. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I explained that. I'm glad to hear every it. <laughs> relationship. The friction had been that I just love yeah. what I am doing yeah. so much, yeah. and and that had always been a problem. And so I think basically I waited for three and a half years because I couldn't believe it that it was <laughs> like really possible to have someone who 
let me work. That's wonderful. And, uh, That's you know, great. So, anyway, congratulations. And, and she's you. great. And you two make a wonderful couple. So I'm very Thank happy you. for you both. So, uh, pwn it and own it. Uh, for episode 814, uh, here mid April, uh, this is when the annual pwn to own com- competition occurs. And ever since they began, we've had a lot of fun. Uh, you, uh, in years past, you sort of gave us the, uh, what was his name? Howard, the, Co- uh, the Cosell, the, the, the Howard Cosell. Howard read. Cosell play by play of <laughs> Pwn to Own. It's an amazing <laughs> battle. Um, and, and I, I made it the topic because it's a little bracing just to watch these guys cut through what, we think of as and hope are secure systems just like eh, figured i'd make an extra 40 grand so here's your escalation of vulnerability uh, or no, your escalation of privilege or i mean an, an oleo you would think by now that maybe the, the like exchange server was safe uh-uh no 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 what uh, there's more uh, oh. <laughs> oh my god yeah. so uh, we're going to start the week with some uh, uh, topics that we need to revisit because, you know, we've been picking good things recently where they keep generating more interesting news. So we're going to look at an additional remote port that Chrome will soon be blocking uh, and perhaps the need to change some server ports if any of our listeners happen to be using the one that Chrome has decided it now needs to block. Uh, we're going to look again at Google's forthcoming Flock. Uh, their, the, you know, their non-tracking technology, uh, and at the new test page that has been put up by the EFF, who doesn't like it. Of course, they don't like anything. Uh, then we're going to revisit the PHP Git server hack now that we understand fully how it happened. Um, and we're going to look at Cisco's eyebrow-raising decision not to update some end-of-life routers that have had, that have newly revealed critical, as in remote access, vulnerabilities. But they've said, eh, they're old. So, no. Uh, and we're also going to examine another instance of the industry's failure to patch for years and the consequences. Um, mm. And mm. then, a, I think a fun blow by blow or hack by hack walkthrough of last week's quite revealing and a little bit chilling uh, pwn to own competition. And I promise not to do my Howard Cosell work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and, and we do we do have uh, uh, this picture of the week I've been sort of sitting on for a while, but I oh. <laughs> just in bueno, for our audience, yeah. when you in context, it's like really? Yeah. Like no, I've been laughing at that one for a while. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get to the picture of the week in just a second. First, a word from a sponsor, brand new sponsor. I'm thrilled. I've been trying to get on the network for some time. Thrilled to welcome Bitwarden uh, to our show. Um, let me explain a little bit about Bitwarden. One of the reasons I really like it. It's password manager. I say that up front, what it is. But I like it because it's open source. It's the only open source cross-platform password manager you can use wherever you are, on the go, at home, or at work. Um, what I also like about Bitwarden, I spent some time talking to them before we're out, the ad a couple of weeks ago. And uh, what I like about them, and I think you're going to like about them, is they don't... Uh, let me see how I can phrase this. They don't need to make money. I mean, they do. <laughs> Okay, they do, and they have a very compelling, very affordable uh, paid offer for business and consumers. But their business model does not rely on converting their free users to paid users. That, I think, for a lot of us now, is very important. You can use Bitwarden free, and you'll be free forever. It's open source. So, <clears throat> you know, that that tells you something right there. They don't, they don't you know, even if they decided to say, oh, no, you're going to pay for it, it's open source, you wouldn't have to. One of the, and I, but I have to tell you, sometimes maybe people, I say open source, people say, oh, that's risky. I don't want to use it. No, that's when you want to use it because you can look at the code. You know exactly what Bitwarden is doing. They are 
fantastic. Every Bitwarden account, personal or business, begins with the creation of your personal vault. That is that highly encrypted, and yes, they use all the proper tools and all the proper, you know, PBKDF and 2 and, a, and a AES and all of that to make sure it's fully private and encrypted. Uh, and that allows you to store your own credentials in there, whether you're a user or a, a business. Now, uh, I should mention a couple of things. You can host yourself. Lots of people use Bitwarden because you can. Bitwarden does have hosting, very, very affordable hosting. I pay 10 bucks a year to use the full features of Bitwarden uh, and let them do the hosting because I think they're going to do a better job than I am. You get to choose. I think that's really important. Now, once you've created that account, let's say you want to use Bitwarden for business. When you as an individual with a Bitwarden vault join a team or a company, then you get to be assigned to the organizational vault, another second vault that doesn't mean you lose your old vault, nor is there sharing between the two, so you don't have to ever worry about your personal stuff getting in your business stuff or vice versa, but you do get to share credentials, which means you log in once, quicker access, quicker productivity, completely customizable. You could turn on or off features using enterprise policies to adapt your business needs. I know that's important to the IT department. Of course, Bitwarden does what you need. It generates unique, secure, lengthy passwords. I often go really long because I don't have to remember it. For every site you or your employees access, it ensures a password is not used more than once. We know now that might be the most important thing any password manager can do. You want to minimize the risk, too, of using weak and vulnerable passwords, not just reusing them. You you can customize as a business, you can cust the organizational version can customize and set password requirements and administrative policies. And of course, you get enterprise grade security. Bitwarden, besides being open source and regularly audited, I think this is what's so important. They, they have regular third party security audits. They are compliant with, I can give you the whole list, but just so you know, Privacy Shield, HIPAA, GDPR, CCPA, the California Privacy Act, uh, SOC 2 and 3, SOC 2 and 3. You can unite your existing systems with Bitwarden using SSO authentication. Directory services, you bet. They have APIs as well. I think this is, for my money, the best out there. And I recently changed. As you know, we had another password manager that we were uh, using. In fact, we still use as an enterprise. But uh, I've been using Bitwarden for... But I used all the password managers, and I've settled on Bitwarden pretty quickly because I like, as you know, I like open source. I love it that it runs natively on Linux, Macs, Windows, iOS, Android, everywhere I am. And as a business, I think you're going to love the Bitwarden cloud. You'll be able to monitor and manage security vulnerabilities using something they call the Bitwarden Vault Health Report, which will give you actionable insights into passwords your employees might be using that have been reused or exposed or potentially compromised. And you can identify any items in your vault that don't have 2FA. You want to turn on two-factor. We know that. Mitigate the likelihood of successful phishing attacks by storing passwords. I shouldn't have to tell you this. You know we're big supporters, Steve and I, of this. Storing passwords and other sensitive information in an end-to-end -end encrypted vault. That's what you get with Bitwarden. The open source password manager trusted by millions of individuals, teams, and organizations worldwide for secure password storage and sharing. It is fantastic. Get the password manager that offers a robust and cost-effective solution that can dramatically increase your chances of staying safe online. Free trial of the Teams or Enterprise plan. They have several, but you can try it for free at bitwarden.com slash twit. And of course, always free for individuals. Always free across device usage for individuals. Um, they've, they've told me very clearly, because I was concerned, they said, our business model does not in any way mean we have to convert free users. We love our free users. Bitwarden, B-I-T-W-A-R-D-E-N dot com slash twit. Give it a try. I think what you see, it's very easy, by the way, to get your passwords out of somebody else's vault and import them into Bitwarden. That's what I did, and I couldn't be happier. Bitwarden.com slash twit. Back to the picture of the weak Mr. Steve Arino. So, <laughs> when I was... I was putting this, I grabbed it from my stock of, of uh, pictures for the podcast. Sometimes I run out. Sometimes I have a little excess. I'd, I've been waiting because we'd had more relevant pictures recently. And I, I put this on the show notes and uh, Lori walked by. And I, and I said, you know, 
look at this. This is like, what, what, what does this say? And she said, that's not real. I said, oh, yeah, they actually said that. You know, anyway, <laughs> this is the big blue, the, I don't know, what is it, aqua colored screen that we all see now who use it's Windows It's Windows 10. Blue, we all know. <laughs> Windows Blue. <laughs> That's right. And anyway, it's just, this is purely rhetorical, of course, but, you know, this is a screen that comes up, I don't remember when, like maybe when it's doing a major... yeah feature update oh, or so something. Annoying. This goes along with all your files are right where you left them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just, but it tells you a little, it is actually a little bit of, I think it tells you a little bit about Microsoft's mindset, frankly, right? Leave everything yeah. to us. Leave everything, everything to, to us. us. Just, just stand back. <laughs> just let us from do it. your computer. Yeah. Oh, and down below it says, "Don't turn off your PC." <laughs> oh yeah, don't this, <laughs> don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, we're 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 busy. So, but leave everything to us. And of course, which begs the question that we often ask on this podcast: What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, anyway, um, that, and you know, L Lori's been abused by Windows Ten. It uh, does the same things to her that it does to everybody else. Oh yeah, and she's like. Really? That's what <laughs> they're actually saying that? Uh-huh, yeah. So, um, as we know, the practice known as NAT slipstreaming, which we've talked about twice recently, uh, uses, or rather abuses, the user's local router's application layer gateway features. Um, through NAT slipstreaming, code running on a browser inside the LAN is able to arrange for unsolicited traffic from outside to get into the LAN and to go to specific devices, thus effectively bypassing the natural firewall features that we love so much and depend upon our NAT routers for. For this form of abuse to work, the browser needs to be able to emit traffic bound for specific remote ports. So browsers have been fighting back, thus our two previous mentions of this, by preventing outbound connections to, the, to specific ab abuse-prone ports, which NAT routers may be monitoring for, their, for application layer traffic. Of course, famously, FTP was a big one, where because of the, the trickiness of the FTP protocol, active FTP, the a packet on the out a packet outbound would itself in the packet carry information for the remote server telling it which port to return its traffic to so the nat router for nat to, to work with active ftp it had to be inspecting the packet's contents realize that this is ftp look inside it to see if it's got that port that the remote server is being told to connect back on because then it needs to proactively open that so that when the remote server does respond on that port, it'll be able to come through the NAT and get back to the, the, to the proper computer inside the LAN. So that, that there's a sort of a simple example, but many of the more fancy, uh, more modern, if you will, protocols are have things in in their actual protocol that affects the traffic. So NAT routers need to be able to listen to that. Um, at the moment, Chrome is blocking port 69, 137, 161, 554, 1719, and 1720, and 1723, 5060, 5061, and 6566. We're talking about this because last Thursday, Google stated that they intend to add TCP port 10, I'm sorry, 10080, so 10,080 to their growing list. Um, and as it turns out, it's been on Firefox's block list since uh, late last year, November of 2020, when it got added for Firefox. Um, that 10,080 port is known to be used by the Amanda backup software and also by VMware's vCenter. But in neither of those two cases is there any need for a web browser 
to be initiating traffic to it, to those ports. So no reason not to block it at the browser. Well, almost none. The biggest concern is that very much like port 8080, which is a popular port of choice for, you know, so-called user land web browsers. You know, we back in the dawn of the podcast, we talked about how in the original Unix implementation of IP networking, ports one or zero, depending upon how you how far down there, te technically is a zero because you could have all the bits, all, all 10 bits of the port number could be zero. Oh, wait, all 16 bits. Sorry. Um, but uh, I was thinking of 10 bits because that's where the, the kernel access ends. Ports 1 through 1023 are reserved so that only processes running with root privilege are able to open ports, those low-numbered ports. As a consequence, it's not possible for a user to run their own web browser on port 80. Being a user, they don't have that. They don't have access to anything below 1024. So, but port 8080 is often used for that. Well, so is 10,080, just because it had, you know, it's a nice high number that ends in 80, uh, which of course is the historically HTTP. Um, so, and, and when I was researching this issue last night, I encountered some instances of problems. There was a posting on Reddit that was titled, Why Firefox Developer Edition Blocks HTTP on Port 10080 After Update. And this guy wrote, My current school project uses port 10080 to run the web application. After the update to Firefox 85B2 dev channel, he said, I need to set network.security.ports.band.override in order to access my web. What's the reason behind the ban of this port? I'm curious because it's not a standard port. Firefox allowed it before, and it's not used by any widely known applications. He's right on all counts. Um... So, of course, we've talked before about how dicey it can be to ever take back anything <laughs> once it's been given. You know, the Internet, the web, and many of its descendant technologies were originally designed by technologists who placed very few and, in retrospect, too few limitations on the use of the new toys that they were creating. Uh, you know, and, and look at how cautious, for example, Google was with Chrome's careful, gradual, tiptoeing removal of FTP. You know, I mean, they, they, they very much wanted to remove it and just not have an FTP client in their browser. But they were also very worried about taking anything away that users might be using and depending upon. So over in the Bugzilla forum, you know, Mozilla's uh, forum, uh, someone posted, I have a similar problem with this change. I have thousands of CPE, and I'm sure he was referring to customer premise equipment with the standard uh, abbreviation, with their management port on 10,080. He says, of course, not accessible from the Internet, but I need to manage them. Is there any option in about colon config that will allow me to use port 10,080 again? Um, and, of course, he was referring to this, to this change, which hit him also in Firefox last November. Um, and somebody at Mozilla replied saying, sorry for the inconvenience this is causing. He, and they, they had a, a three-bullet point instruction. Go to about colon config. Create a new pref of type string with the name network.security.ports.band.override. And, and first of all, I didn't even know you could do that. I thought like all of the preferences were built in and you, 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 you search for a piece of one in the search bar and then you get them. But when I, when I went and looked, it's like, oh, sure enough, there's a plus sign over on the right. You can create your own. So... Cool. Anyway, and the third instruction is add the required ports as the preference value. 
He says you can also add multiple as a comma separated list of, of ranges or, or list or as ranges. So, and he says the change does not require a restart. So we should point out you can create your own, but it might not do anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if, you, if if you say you know wave dot high dot yeah. two dot mom, not then, do anything. Yeah, the, clearly Mozilla's but, code does check to see if such a preference exists. And if yeah, it, you you yeah. could like maybe discover a cookie that nobody knew was in there, right? Yeah, I if bet there's a lot of stuff really, in there. Yeah, yeah. Who yeah, knows? Don't don't spend your time. No. <laughs> <laughs> so. As far as Chrome's decision goes, uh, their developer, Adam Rice, noted of port 10,080, he said, it is an attractive port for HTTP because it ends in 80 and does not require root privileges to bind on Unix systems to allow developers to continue using the port. He said that they'll be adding an enterprise policy that developers can use to override the block. Once Chrome's changes in place that will happen at some point. I didn't see any version number, but, you know, imminently. Um, users will receive an error unsafe port message whenever Chrome attempts to access remote port 10,080. So the takeaway for our listeners is that it would probably be a good idea to migrate any services you might be hosting on port 10,080 which need to be accessed from web browsers, uh, you know, move them to, you know, what, 9,080 or, or something. You know, 10,081. Or, you know, yes. I'm sure there's plenty of places. You, I mean, there's 65,000 places you can go. So. <laughs> exactly. But my question is, and I don't, I don't think anybody's answered this, why 10,080? Is there something going on in 10,080 that they're trying to prevent? And I, I, the reason I ran across those other references was I was asking the same question of the great internet and I was unable to find an answer. So there's, you know, it is not a widely used port. Uh, the only reason, it, you know, it fell under the, the category of NAT slipstreaming. So it must be that there somewhere is a router that Google, that matters, that Google became aware of, that is abusable if it sees traffic passing by it to 10,080, you know, not any of our consumer routers, because as, as, as we said, you know, those are generally low numbered ports that are, that are bound to services that, that need some special treatment. But so perfect question, Leo. And I, I think I, I found and, it. You're the one who should know. You got Shields Up. I'm sure you test that port, right? <laughs> right. Actually, Shields Up is a really great resource for looking at what different ports, especially the canonical ports, are being used for. Apparently, 10,080 is used by Amanda. Yes. There is an Amanda backup software that uses it. Uh, but, you know. Which is broken now. But <laughs> sorry, Amanda. Oh, uh, no, but uh, because it's not. Uh, Is it inbound? That's or? a very good question. Yeah. And, and when I was digging around, I came away thinking that browsers didn't need to access that. But maybe that is Amanda's web interface, and mm. Google just said, "Well, sorry, as you said, uh, sorry, Amanda, but uh, you know this is more important." So yeah. and it must be because you know even Adam recognizes that it, there may be some breakage, uh, but there is a command injection privilege escal ex escalation exploit CVE one thirty two seven ninety four for Amanda. So I wonder if this was to mitigate. Interesting. Maybe that. they are preventing that th yeah. that abuse of that through Chrome. Yeah. And you could use Shodan, whatever. right? You can you could scan for that port on Shodan and see what happens. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You and you would find everybody who had it open. Right. And it, we all ought to also note that for some reason Firefox added that. Oh, in fact, it is does say Amanda on the Firefox list. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is I an old. It's a notes? it's a 2019 uh, CVE. No, I'm sorry, 2016 CD. A user with backup privileges could trivially compromise a client installation. Uh, and uh, that might be why. But you would think they would want Amanda to fix the exploit as opposed to blocking yeah, the port exactly. for everybody. Like, block it for everybody. Yeah. And, and, and Leo, uh, in, in the show notes, I do have that, that searchfox.org Mozilla hyphen central. If you click that, because I saw that there, that there there's a pound 98, that'll jump you right to the top of 
of of Mozilla's huge list of blocked ports. It's like way more wow. even than Chrome is blocking. Interesting. So yeah, wow. they're they're really shutting down a bunch of 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 ports on the outbound side. And you'll notice at the bottom there, there's, there's, Amanda. there's there it is with and it's labeled Amanda. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. So, so all of these it, other ports are used for exploits too, right? Why else would you block them? Yes. And well, but the, but the other thing is that uh, as we know, when a client, any client of any of our operating systems says, "Give me a give me an outbound port." They they start being allocated um, lo on for on local ports from 1024 and up. So, you know, all of those services are going to be down low and it would, and, and of course, as we know, web browsers by default aim their traffic at 443 for HTTPS. If you can force them over HTTP anymore, that'll be port 80, but you can, you know, put colon and then the port number in some script, you know, JavaScript or in on your page to go pull a resource from any port you want to remotely. So anyway, uh, it does uh, does look like they've, you know, locked down one more problem. And, and Mozilla points to um, spec.whatwg.org for a port blocking spec that uh, has all these ports on it. Right. So there's some internet group. It does not have. I know it's ten thousand eighty on it yet, but there's some group uh, on you know on the internet that's saying these these ports should be blocked due to a bad port. I don't know what that all means. Wow. So these are the bad ports. <laughs> don't use those bad ports. No. <laughs> so uh, believe it or not. Uh, this abbreviation of Google's is just, it's not going to go down uh, easily. I mean, we figured out, we kind of reverse engineered it, but well, you jumped on it because you realized that they had all these bird themed things o over at Google projects. And so of course there would be, they had to use flock for, you know, their, their tracking or their, their anti-tracking, abbreviation and so then you have from if you have flock of birds then you're going to have to reverse engineer which is why we get the the really awful federated learning of cohorts which wow you know so we ask rhetorically are you flocked or rather actually the EFF <laughs> actually did ask that um, our, our podcast three weeks ago bore the title "What What the Flock" because we had to explain what it was about, and now the EFF has put up a test site, which can be used to determine one's uh, flockage, I suppose, uh, with the title. This is literally the title: "Am I flocked?" So, <laughs> F L O C. Uh, F L O C, yes, children. Uh, A M I F L O C E D dot org. M I flocked dot org. Now so I'm on a Firefox, so I presume I'm not flocked. Uh, you could not be. Right. Yes. Uh, and, and Brave so has only... decided not to, they're a Chromium port, but they've decided not to include flock. Interesting. Yeah. Well, at this juncture, it'll be well. But, but of course, they're also brave. So they're brave. their their they whole deal it. is yeah. Yeah, is yeah. privacy. But if you if you click that little red button there, Leo, that you had on the page a second ago, uh, I tried to click it for you through the camera, but didn't. Work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. No flock. <laughs> I am not flocked. You have to so, have Chrome eighty nine or up. Ah. Okay. So we already know from our coverage three weeks ago that the best way to characterize the EFF's position is that any form of bias in the treatment of users of the internet no matter the means is a fundamentally bad idea says the EFF because it discriminates among internet users who in their view should all be treated identically and of course as we know Google's flock uh, creates a temporary and transient tag formed from hashing the websites Chrome has visited during the previous week, the immediately previous week. 
So even though it is expressly not tracking, and even though Google plans to terminate all third-party cookie support in Chrome, which, yay, we should herald that, um, in their transition to Flock, the EFF will be satisfied with nothing less than an entirely non-customized experience on the Internet. So they've created Am I Flocked uh, to test and display whether you and your instance of Chrome may have been randomly chosen to participate in Google's initial Flock research, which Google refers to as an origin trial. It's odd phraseology, but that's what they call it. The EFF's page opens with the headline, Google is testing Flock on Chrome users worldwide. Find out if you're one of them. Chances are not, but I can't wait to get some feedback from our listeners because based on the probabilities, we'll certainly have some who are. <clears throat> they said, the EFF said, Google is running a Chrome origin trial to test out an experimental new tracking feature, which we, it isn't, but okay, EFF, about federate called Federated Learning of Cohorts, a.k.a. Flock. According to Google, the trial currently affects 0.5% of users in selected regions, including Australia, Brazil, Canada, India, Indonesia, Japan, Mexico, New Zealand, the Philippines, and the U.S. This page will try to detect whether you've been made a guinea pig in Google's ad tech experiment. Okay, so 0.5% is one in every 200 Chrome users. And assuming a statistically neutral assignment, we will surely have many listeners among us. Um, I checked two of my Chrome instances at my two locations, and I came up negative at each. So it'll be interesting. Uh, what's also interesting is the EFF's take. I'm going to share a little more of what they wrote. They said, what is Flock? Third-party cookies are the technology, they wrote, that powers much of the surveillance, the surveillance advertising, as they refer to it, in business today. But cookies are on their way out. And I would argue, yes, thanks to Google. But they said cookies are on their way out. And Google is trying to design a way for advertisers to keep targeting users based on their web browsing once cookies are gone. It's come up with, it's meaning Google, has come up with Flock. Flock runs in your browser. It uses your browsing history from the past week to assign you to a group of other similar people around the world. Each group receives a label called a flock ID, which is supposed to capture meaningful information about your habits and interests. Flock then displays this label to everyone you interact with on the web. And remember from our first discussion of this, that's one of the points EFF makes is that, you know, you're, it's a beacon saying, this is me. Yeah, that's the you big know? problem, I think, right? Because anybody yeah. can see it. That's when I found that out. I thought, wow, that's bad. That is true. And so they say this makes it easier to identify you with browser fingerprinting. So that's one of the other reasons EFF doesn't like it is that, as we know, fingerprinting takes advantage of as many different signals as your browser is making available. And wow, if it's a flock ID is going to be a big signal, to, uh, you know, with with many bits of 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 non entropy the, to help track you, so they said uh, uh, this makes it easier to identify you with, with browser fingerprinting and gives trackers a head start on profiling you. You can read EFF's analysis and criticisms of Flock here, and they have a link to yeah you know the rant which we looked at a couple weeks ago. So they said the Chrome origin trial for Flock has been deployed to millions of random Chrome users without warning, much less consent. While Flock is eventually intended to replace tracking cookies during the trial, it will give trackers 
access to even more information about subjects. That, okay, that's true, but then cookies are going to go away, assuming this happens. They said the origin trial is likely to continue into July of 2021 and may eventually affect as many as 5% of Chrome users worldwide. So one in 20. Um, and they said, see our blog post. So under how can I opt out? They said, for now, the only way for users to opt out of the flock trial in Chrome is by disabling third-party cookies, which was news to me. That's interesting. They said, this may reset your preferences on some sites and break features like single sign-on. Um, you can also use a different browser. Other browsers, during, including independent platforms like Firefox, as well as Chromium-based browsers like Edge and Brave, do not currently have Flock enabled. If you are a website owner, and this is interesting, if you're a website owner, your site will automatically be included in Flock calculations if it accesses the Flock API or if Chrome detects that it serves ads. Probably you know, their ads. So, um, you can opt out of this calculation by sending the following HTTP response header. So the header is permissions hyphen policy colon, and then interest hyphen cohort equals, and then a null set. So just open and close parens, which is interesting. So, you know, if you were of course, that, that's on the server side. But if for some reason you didn't want your, you, if you didn't want visitors coming to your site to have your site's uh, flock identity, whatever that is, we'll talk about the SIM hash in just a second, added into or to affect your visitor's flock ID, then you could arrange, you could easily add that response header to your server, your site's server's responses, which would instruct the the flock accumulating, you know, the flock ID accumulating browser at this point only some in, some instances of Chrome to not consider that you had visited that site. So finally, what does my flock ID mean? If you've been read, been assigned a flock ID, it means that your browser. That is, if you click this test, right, and it says, oh, here's your, you know, here's your ID. Uh, and I'd love to know if it changes, like, every week. Anyway. Uh, it yeah, it'd be nice. Browser. Oh, it's, so it does tell you your, uh, your cohort, you, so you know who you are. Yeah, it's supposed to change regularly. It's, it, yeah, 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 that would be interesting. Yeah. Um, now I want it. it I'm going to get yeah. a Chrome. Chrome. <laughs> yeah. Chrome. Yeah. yeah. What cohort it, am I in? Exactly. Uh, and does, is, is it right? Is it wrong? I can't I mean, test you know, this. Knows? I literally don't run Chrome anywhere. Which is good, yeah, I think. It, yeah. It is. It's, I'm it's, starting to yeah. be glad. So it means that your browser has processed your browsing history and assigned you to a group of, and they have in quotes, a few thousand, which I'm skeptical about too. I mean, th they're saying on the order of 33,000 groups, but if you multiply 33,000 by a few thousand, you get, what, like 33 million. Well, there are a lot more than 33 million U Chrome users in the world. So, you know, either it, it needs to be a larger flock ID, meaning more granular tagging, or the groups have to be larger than a few thousand. Anyway, mm. we'll, I, we'll see how this evolves. But, you know, something's not quite right about this. Mm -hmm. So they said the numeric label is not meaningful on its own. However, large advertisers like Google and websites like Google will be able to analyze traffic from millions of users to figure out what the members of a particular flock have in common. So that's sort of interesting. That says that there, there isn't, uh, like, bits are not assigned in the ID, meaning, oh, that, that bit's for commerce sites, this bit's for outdoor camping, this bit's for autos, uh, you know, it's like, it's not like that. So apparently, and, and we'll talk about the SIM hash, as I said in a second, but so it's, it's very fuzzy. And so you need to be somebody like a Google who has, 
you know, it's fingers out everywhere, like like analytics, right? It's, they've got analytics probes everywhere. Their analytics probe will receive the flock ID. They will know what site their analytics probe is on. So they'll be able to aggregate these flock IDs over the whole internet effectively and reverse engineer that, you know, these IDs or have been seen on all of these websites where we have Google Analytics probes. And of course, Facebook is the same way with their like buttons everywhere and 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 advertisers with, you know, serving ads across the internet. So you can sort of see how this the this closes the loop. It isn't tracking. It, it is profiling, which is the word I'm going to recommend in a minute that, that they switch to using for accuracy's sake. But, you know, so and it does require a lot of back end work to to be constantly associating these these tags, which are changing weekly. And maybe they I guess maybe the flock IDs themselves would settle down after a while and then who was carrying them would change from week to week. Anyway, you know, really interesting technology. Um, and so uh, I'm going to stop sharing what, what they wrote. We have enough of that. So, you know, you and I, Leo, indicated three weeks ago that it seemed like an improvement over explicit tracking by third-party cookies. Although when we looked, when we dug in a little bit further and realized, okay, you know, one of the EFF's points is that it, it you know, it does present a tag, a, a, a kind of who I am ish tag, to though to sites who have a way of understanding it. It may though be that due to the nature, I mean, like it's not going to be a, a tag with an obvious public meaning. Uh, so you know, if if I saw tags coming to me from visitors at GRC, I I, I don't have probes all over the internet like Google and advertisers do. So it's just. It's just, you know, nonsense for me. Um, so uh, it, I, 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 what I did want to say is that I wish EFF would drop their insistence on calling it tracking. It, it is not tracking. Um, and, and I think it weakens them, their position, which has some merit, if they call it profiling, which, you know, is equally derogatory um, in, in its connotation, <laughs> yeah. you know, maybe people worse. Don't, people don't, yeah. People don't want to be profiled, but that's really what it's doing. It's right. a profiling distillation essentially. Um, so, you know, uh, so what's different about this, I, I promise to talk about the, the, the SIM hash. I was looking into it a little bit more, a highly desirable and in fact, a required feature of any traditional cryptographic hash is that, a tiny difference, even a difference of one bit in the what, what we call the digest, right? The hash's input. A one-bit change yields dramatically different hashed results. And in fact, when we talked about, you know, the, the actual technology of cryptographic hashes in the past, we noted that if you change one bit in a big digest that you feed to a cryptographically strong hash... On average, a, a random set of half of the resulting bits will change, which is mind-boggling. That's just so cool. You, you change one bit in what you feed into the hash, and on average, a random set of half of the hash's output put bits change. But the SIM hash algorithm that Google plans to use deliberately produces similar hash results, thus the name sim hash, when given similar inputs. So in other words, if you hash the big digest that we were just talking about, but didn't change much of it, the output won't change much either. That is, similar input results in a similar hash value. It's still a hash, but Two inputs that may have similarities will result in a similar result, which is interesting. That's, so there's a sense of like um, a, a, a computation, a mathematical 
concept of distance. You know, how far away from each other are two similar things that you run through the sim hash, and it it approximates that. So, so that that that's like the secret behind the Chrome's ability to to pour all the places you go to on the net over the course of a week into this sim hash and distill it down to something which is in some way representative of the nature of the places you went without explicitly revealing where you went. And, and that's, from the user standpoint, that's kind of cool. Because in the same way that a, that a password hash does, you know, in, where it's exacting, right, You'll, if you put the same password in, you get the same hash, which is how we use password hashes. Yet the hash itself tells you nothing about the password. Similarly, presumably the SIM hash won't reveal which similar sites you went to, but that apparently you went to some. So anyway, I, I guess as a tech junkie, I think it's kind of cool. It'll be interesting to see how it all evolves. Uh, but in any event, I would love to have our Chrome using listeners go to miflocked, F-L-O-C-E-D dot org and see whether, you know, th this thing says, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> at the moment you are, uh, uh, you know, tweet uh, me at SGGRC on, on Twitter. I, if you, uh, if you go there and you get some positive results, I think it'd just be kind of cool. And Leo, what will be also cool you want is letting break. our listeners know uh, <laughs> who we have to thank for the next chunk of fabulous security now. We have the canary to thank. And, you know, I, I love, you know, we love honeypots. And here it is. That's my honeypot. That's my honeypot. It's my, oh, it's, can, I it's, think. I see a light on it. It's, even it's on. Of course, it's, uh, a, it's an on honeypot. Oh. It's waiting for your visit. Uh, the canary is more than just a honeypot. It's the easiest little appliance device you can put on your network. But here's what's cool about the canary. It can look like anything. It can, uh, my canary right now is a Synology NAS. It has the same MAC address as a Synology. It has the same login and user interface as a Synology. It, it, in every respect, if a hacker's inside my network and sees that and, uh, and tries to log in, He's going to have that Synology experience. Of course, the login won't work because he doesn't know the password. But I'm going to get an alert that says, this is somebody trying to log in to your fake Synology NAS. It could be a Windows server. It could be a SCADA device. It could be just pretty much about anything. Linux box, a router, a switch. Attackers won't know they've been caught because they'll try to log in. They don't have the full credentials. But they will. And what's great about the canary is it's not going to bombard you with a million alerts. It's going to give you a few actionable alerts you can do something about right away. Email or text message. It can work on a console. You'll get a console with your canary. You can have Slack. It uses webhooks, uh, syslog. Uh, they even have an API if you want to write some sort of custom interface. It's so clever. The folks who've con invented the canary have been in the security game for 20 years. They have taught companies, militaries, governments how to break into networks. And because they know how to break into networks, they know how to build a device that people who are already in the network will be attracted to. A honeypot, the Thinkst Canary. Canaries are deployed all over the world, in all seven continents. They're really one of the best tools against data breaches. We know, and if you listen to the show, you know that the biggest problem these days is the guy who already took advantage of, let's say, the exchange server flaw, got in the network. You you mitigated, you patched the flaw, but they're in the network. Advanced persistent threats are everywhere. And on average, it takes a company 191 days, six months, to realize there's been a data breach. And we, you know, pretty well-known examples of it taking a lot longer, sometimes years, um, you want to know the minute somebody's inside your network. And that's what the canary does. Canary does something else that's really cool. I can generate files, they call them Canary tokens, that look like PDFs or doc files or spreadsheets, whatever you want them to look like. But if somebody tries to open them, you'll also get an immediate notice. There's somebody at this address on this device trying to get in. So for instance, I made a few spreadsheets that said things like employee information or 
I'm not so blatant. I said social security numbers, but I figure if you're going to attack our network, you're going to know where to look, and I'm going to make something that looks like just what you want. You could put them on Active Directory. You could put them, yeah. Uh, you can you can deploy them throughout your entire network. Again, they can look like a variety of different things. Each canary can look like something different, and you can change it anytime you want. It's very easy. It's like a tripwire on your network. The canary philosophy is trivial to deploy with a ridiculously high quality of signal. That's exactly what you get with the Thinks Canary. Some small companies might have a handful. Big banks, other you know agencies that need to protect themselves might have hundreds spread all around. I would, right? Uh, if you want to know more, go to Canary, C-A-N-A-R-Y, like the bird, because it's a canary in a coal mine, get it? Canary.tools slash twit. Now, I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say you want five canaries. That includes a, your hosted console, upgrades. If you sit on a canary and break it, they'll send you a new one, no questions asked, support, maintenance for a whole year, $7,500. Uh, but if you use the offer code TWIT, when you buy it in the How Did You Hear About Us box, they're going to cut your price down by 10%. And not just for that first purchase, but forever. You'll always be paying 10% less. People say, how did you get that deal? Oh, I know people. You know us. You know security now. Canary.tools slash twit. Don't forget the twit code in the how did you hear about us box. And by the way, we know you're going to love these. But if for any reason they don't suit, you've got two months for a money back refund. Complete money back guarantee. So 60 days to try this thing. Remember, <laughs> the average amount of time a company spends before they figure out somebody's in the network is six months. Often much longer. Is there somebody in your network? You need a Thinks Canary. And if, you know, if it doesn't say anything, you could say, oh, I hear nothing. I love that sound. I hear nothing from my Canary. We've used it. And in fact, it's worked. We've, we've, I got the alert, and it really worked. It's really cool. Uh, Thinks, T-H-I-N-K-S-T is the company, but the website is canary.tools slash twit. Don't forget to use the offer code twit. Get your Thinks Canary. Steve? Yeah, we do know that that surveillance is now what happens first. Uh, I, you yeah, know, they wander around. Bit. They they yeah. check it out. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. They they want to know like they there there's a get ready stage before the the go stage, yeah. and uh, be nice to shut them down then. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, while we're doing follow ups on past topics, the week after. Our what the flock episode was get me some PHP, <laughs> uh, and as our listeners know, that was uh, about what I felt was you know had to be the oh so deliberately obvious yeah. hack yeah. of the PHP project's private Git server. You know, the, uh, the the press all saw only the fact that the Git server had been hacked and a, a backdoor had been installed, but or code for a backdoor was there, but the way it was done, you know, the guy was sending up fireworks. Um, so in the middle of last week, we, we received an update on the PHP project's ongoing investigation of exactly what happened. Now we know. Uh, Nikita Popov, or Popov, uh, who was one of the two people, you know, he, he was the, the main guy involved in tracking this down, uh, and it was his identity, uh, along with Rasmus's, the original PHP inventor, uh, designer, uh, whose was, was, name was used in the two commits, which created this hack. So he posted... Uh, Update on git.php.net incident. Uh, his posting is long and detailed, and his link is here in the show notes for anyone who's curious. But the short version is that some legacy stuff bit them in the, in the butt. Uh, they had a seldom used secondary and less secure means for pushing commits into their private Git repository. Uh, Nikita, who is very much on top of this, wasn't even aware of this secondary back channel at the time. He wrote, when the first malicious commit was made under Rasmus's name, my initial reaction was to revert the change and revoke commit access for Rasmus's account. 
on the assumption that this was an individual account compromise. In hindsight, he said, this action didn't really make sense because there was, at the time, no reason to believe that the push occurred through Rasmus's account in particular. Any account with access to the PHP-source repository could have performed the push under a false name. Then he said, when the second malicious commit was made under my own name, I reviewed the logs of our Gitolite installation in order to determine which account was actually used to perform the push. However, while all adjacent commits were accounted for, no git receive pack entries for the two malicious commits were present, which means that these two commits bypassed the Gitolite infrastructure entirely. This was interpreted as likely evidence of a server compromise. Something I was not aware of at the time is that git.php.net intentionally supported using changes not only via SSH. And he says, parens, using the Gitolite infrastructure and public key crypto, but also via HTTPS. The latter did not use Gitolite and instead used git-http-backend behind Apache 2 digest authentication against the master php.net user database. He says, I'm not sure why password-based authentication was supported in the first place, as it is much less secure than public key authentication. Anyway, he then shows us a chunk of the Apache PHP, uh, HTTP server log showing the two commits. And he, he notes, it is notable that the attacker only makes a few guesses at usernames and successfully authenticates, meaning has the password, once the correct username has been found. While we don't have any specific evidence for this, a possible explanation is that the user database of master.php.net has been leaked, although it's unclear why the attacker would need to guess usernames in that case. The master.php.net system, which is used for authentication and various management tasks, was running, and here it is, <clears throat> very old code on a very old operating system slash PHP version. So some kind of vulnerability would not be terribly surprising. We've made a number of changes to increase the security of this system. Good. <laughs> so four bullet points. Master PHP Net was migrated to a new system running PHP 8 and renamed to main PHP net at the same time. Among other things, the new system supports TLS 1.2, which means you should no longer see TLS version warnings when accessing this site. So, yeah, it had been a little creaky. Uh, the implementation has been moved towards using parameterized queries to be more confident that SQL injections cannot occur. Passwords are now stored using bcrypt. Uh, elsewhere, he had mentioned that they were using MD5, which, you know, it's long been deprecated everywhere. And finally, existing passwords were reset. So then he says that where to go if you need to generate yourself a new one because your old ones won't work. So it's a little distressing that right in the middle of the home of PHP, we find a very old server with like sending warning messages because it doesn't support any of the new TLS protocols that our browsers are using on a very old platform running a very old PHP that no one has looked at or is really even aware of for quite a long while. And, you know, you know me, old doesn't automatically mean bad. Plenty of old things were written well and have stood the test of time. 
but big complex operating systems, feature-laden web servers, and PHP do not generally number among those things. So now we have the point of entry. I still think of the attacker as more of a prankster due to the crying out loud code he placed onto the server, which demanded to be noticed. Um, he somehow arranged to authenticate as two very high-profile developers, again, making sure his changes would be caught. And they never really did determine exactly how, and they really didn't care. They just got rid of it all, replacing it with up-to-date solutions to do the same thing. And, yes, they did also move the entire working PHP repository, which had up to that point had just been a backup repository. Now it's the main working repository over to GitHub so they can focus upon PHP development and not worry about the security of the access controls of the repository. So all a good move, uh, a little embarrassing, but it's nice. I mean, it was good for them to say, uh, you know, yeah, this thing was so dusty that we're not surprised that uh, somebody was able to crawl in. We don't really care how. We just got rid of it all. Um, a constant in our industry is the dilemma of deliberately terminating important critical patch support for previously supported systems that have reached the end of their support life cycle. You know, we often talk about how, about this with Microsoft and Windows. Uh, it's especially irksome when some people are receiving paid-for updates while others are not. So it's not as if those updates don't exist. But even mighty Microsoft occasionally, uh, we might even say often, bends to the severity of their own mistakes to offer out-of-life cycle patches when the cost to them of doing so, if only, I guess, in reputation damage, would be prohibitive. They just did this uh, at the start of March by reaching way back to patch Exchange Server 2010 for the proxy logon flaws, even though that version was well past its kill-by date. Um, but we've also we, we've seen similar situations uh where Cisco, for example, and in this case, makes a different call. And it's not as if Cisco's commercial products are not similarly littered with patchable vulnerabilities. You know, they are. Not to mention that spate of secret accounts and passwords that's appeared throughout their, their high-end products as people started poking around in their networking firmware and found that they'd hard-coded all those back doors. We, you know, we were covering that for a while a couple years ago. Today, Cisco has informed the world that it has no plans to fix critical security vulnerabilities affecting some of its smaller Soho, you know, the small business routers. Um, what does it tell its past customers to do? Replace them with new Cisco devices. You know, or <laughs> perhaps it's time to consider changing brands. Uh, the bug they all share is tracked as CVE 2021-1459. And it carries the difficult-to-achieve CVSS score of 9.8 out of 10. It's hard to get up there. Uh, just about the only way to get a higher score is if it's able to attack you after it's been unplugged. In this case, it's, it's a bad vulnerability. Uh, four routers are affected. The RV110W, which is a VPN firewall, and three small business routers, the RV130, the 130W, and the RV2015W routers. In each of the four cases, the known flaws uh, allow an unauthenticated remote attacker to execute arbitrary code on the affected device. In other words, <laughs> 9.8. Um, the flaw, which stems from improper validation of user-supplied input in the, wait for it, web-based management interface, 
when have we ever heard of that being a problem, could be exploited to send specially crafted HTTP requests to the device to achieve remote code execution. Cisco's advisory said, quote, a successful exploit could allow the attacker to execute arbitrary code as the root user on the underlying operating system of the affected device, unquote. They also said the Cisco small business RV110W, RV130, and RV130W, oh, and RV213W routers have entered the end-of-life process. <laughs> Painful, as it is in this case. Customers, they said, are encouraged to, mitig- to migrate to the Cisco small business RV132W, RV160, and RV160W routers. So... I looked them up. The routers are their lowest end little plastic consumer box routers. The W suffix in each case means wireless. So that's the wireless flavor. Um, The new replacements, for example, the RV160 and the RV160W are $114 and $145 respectively at the moment on Amazon. So... You know, in any event, not a huge investment. It's not as if, you know, they're leaving their major enterprise customers out to dry. No self-respecting enterprise would have one of those, hopefully. Uh, And sadly, even if they were to update the firmware, that is, if they were to offer updates of the firmware of those old and no longer being made or supported routers, how many of them would even ever get the updated code, right? I mean, these things are forgotten in a back room. You know, we know that there will be tons of those older routers out on the net, thanklessly doing their job day in and day out. And presumably, people chose the Cisco brand because they'd heard of Cisco and wanted the assurance of a superior product. So let's hope that the default configuration was to disable remote web access and that no one ever had it turned on. You know, this is another of those we see them too often web management interface issues. Hopefully no one is exposing their router's web management interface to the internet. And I'm sure that all of our listeners know that unless remote management is really needed and is being actively used, Web management, all remote management, should always be kept off of the public Internet. One thing to note is that all of the tech press, which covered Cisco's announcement of this trouble, led their stories saying, Cisco says, and I'm quoting one of them, Cisco says it will not patch three small business router models and one VPN firewall device with critical vulnerabilities Unquote. That was repeated over and over in similar words. So, you know, it appears to matter to the tech press. Uh, you know, at the same time, you know, how long are they supposed to, you know, be responsible for routers that they are no longer selling? Uh, you know, I just thought I would say that so that we can sort of take this as a learning moment, the one right way to handle the need for remote access is to turn off remote access everywhere. Then use one high-quality SSH server that requires a password and a certificate and a time-based additional factor for authentication. And while you're at it, run that server on some random port. There's no reason not to. Don't leave it on the default SSH port. If you use SSH to securely... Oh, I'm sorry. So so then you use SSH to securely first gain access to the internal network, then perform any required administrative work from the inside over LAN-bound interfaces... Um, And it's even possible to run a standard Windows remote desktop connection over SSH. It works great. So that, to me, that's the way to do this is, you know, I've I've often talked about this. If you, if you're, 
If your remote ends have fixed IPs and fixed IP ranges, absolutely use IP address filtering so that nobody can even see those ports, you know, when they're scanning from Shodan or, you know, any of the growing number of, 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 of commercial or private scanners. Only people, you know, like at a sister uh, uh, IP network uh, by IP address are able to even have any access. But if for some reason you need roaming access where you're able to connect from any IP, the only thing, the only presence ought to be an SSH server somewhere that is that is high quality, that you're, you're, you're paying attention to, um, you, you, you've, you know, you got three different ways to authenticate something, you know, something you have and something that's changing all the time. You need to use those that get you in. And then from the inside, you can do all kinds of things that, you know, that's to, to that today. That's the way to set this up. Um, okay. Our final, before we get to our, our big t conversation about pwn to own, um, I titled this Failure to Patch, um, and it, it'll, it'll lead us to talk a little bit more about the, the nature of this kind of problem. Way back in early 2019, Fortinet, major internet supplier of, of, of internet-connected appliances, they produce, among other things, the FortiGate SSL VPN. The, early in 2019... They received notification through responsible disclosure for a critical, remotely exploitable vulnerability in several current releases of their 40 OS, as they call it, which forms the basis of several products. The security researchers in question were Mei Chang and Orange Sai from the DevCore security research team. We'll be hearing their name again uh, later in this post podcast. And we've talked about Orange Psy and DevCore recently. That's the guy who, or maybe it's a real name. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but in any event, they're the people who informed Microsoft in 2020 that they had a problem with Exchange Server. The, so... You know, and we're going to be talking about them in Pwn to Own. So you pay attention when these guys say, hey, uh, we found a critical remotely exploitable vulnerability in your SSL VPN. So Fortinet, back shortly, uh, found and immediately fixed the trouble. The, they were told in early 2019, they it, it afflicted three branches of their 40 OS the 5.4, 5.6, and 6.0 branches. And in May of 2019, they produced update patches and their FortiGuard Labs, which is the security research side, published a clear vulnerability disclosure explaining that, quote, a path traversal vulnerability in the FortiOS SSL VPN web portal, <coughs> web portal, may allow an unauthenticated attacker to download 40 OS system files through specially crafted HTTP resource requests. Okay, now once again, a path traversal, right? We, uh, we keep having those problems uh, occurring also as a consequence of the fact that we have hierarchical directory structures and dot, dot, backslash, you know, moves you up a level. Anyway, that was May 2019. Three months later, so the, oh, they, they announced it, they contacted their customers, sent out email, uh, you know, made the official declaration, had the patches out. Uh, the DevCore guys, responsible disclosure, right? They let them know. Um, and it turns out the DevCore guys were going to make a presentation uh, in the upcoming uh, uh, Black Hat conference. So three months later, on August 28th, Fortinet posted a blog titled, 40 OS and SSL vulnerabilities. That was the title. And they explained that, quote, at the recent Black Hat 2019 conference held in Las Vegas this past August 3rd through 8th, security researchers 
discussed their discovery of security vulnerabilities that impacted several security vendors, including Fortinet. All of the vulnerabilities impacting Fortinet were fixed in April and May of 2019. But in their disclosure, this disclosure in August, we get another little interesting tidbit. They said, in addition, <laughs> it was also disclosed and fixed in May that 40 OS included a magic, and they have that in quotes, a magic string value that had been previously created at the request of a customer to, oh, this is always so bad, but at the request of a customer to enable users to implement a password change process when said password was expiring. That function had been inadvertently bundled <laughs> into the general 40 OS release. <laughs> oh. Yeah. And an improper authorization vulnerability resulted in that value being usable on its own to remotely change the password. Oh, God. Oh. Oh. So basically, they left a magic string. Backdoor, basically. Backdoor, yeah. yes, that allowed an unauthenticated, because after all, if you forgot the password, you couldn't log in to authenticate yourself. So let's just have a magic password bypass. Oh. <laughs> and it was discovered, apparently. Yeah, oh, exactly. God. Yeah. Well, because it was revealed at Black Hat, and uh, which, you know, they which their previous disclosure did not say because it was too embarrassing, right? It's yeah. like, okay, yeah. we'll just, uh, we, we fixed it. We don't fixed worry. It. You know, just please don't worry uh, your get yourself head about it. Yeah, yeah get yeah. yourself <laughs> patched quickly. <laughs> oh, Lord. So a few days before that, uh, this had hit the tech press um, because it was, you know, Black Hat. So, for example, uh, Dan Gooden, writing for Ars Technica, titled his story, Hackers are actively trying to steal passwords from two widely used VPNs. And Dan opened with, quote, Hackers are actively unleashing attacks that attempt to steal encryption keys, passwords, and other sensitive data from servers that have failed to apply critical fixes for two widely used virtual private network VPN products, researchers said. He said, the vulnerabilities can be exploited by sending unpatched servers web requests that contain a special sequence of characters. Researchers at the Black Hat Security Conference in Las Vegas said earlier this month, the pre-authorization file reading vulnerabilities resided in the FortiGate SSL VPN installed on, <clears throat> wait for it, about 480,000 servers. Mm. So, yeah, this is a popular solution. Nearly half a million servers. Mm. Mm. And the competing Pulse Secure SSL VPN installed on about 50,000 machines. Uh, and that's researchers from DevCore Security Consulting reported. So, yeah, 480,000 FortiGate SSL VPN instances. Yikes. At the time, the internet was being sprayed. That's the term that was used in several of the other reports, sprayed with probes, seeking to find and exploit these now well-known weaknesses. Okay? So then nearly a year passes. On July 16th of 2020, Fortinet blogs with the title ATP29, Right, that's the advanced persistent or, or uh, ATP twenty nine is the is the uh, uh, a, yeah APT advanced persistent threat twenty nine targeting SSL VPN flaws that you know that is so in on July last summer twenty twenty they're blogging that the well known APT twenty nine group are targeting their devices. They wrote. United Kingdom's National Cybersecurity Center, NCSC, and Canada's Communications Security Establishment, CSE, have published research into the activity of APT29, 
also known as the Dukes, or, of course, we know them as Cozy Bear, who have, they're Russians, who have been targeting various organizations involved in COVID-19 vaccine development in Canada, the United States, and the UK, highly likely with the intention of stealing information and intellectual property relating to the development and testing of COVID-19 vaccines. And, and, you know, there was reporting, right, about espionage uh, last summer relating to COVID-19 and attempts to get in. Now we understand one of the ways in. They, uh, they wrote, uh, Fortinet wrote, the initial attack vectors for this group have been unpatched vulnerabilities in SSL VPN solutions from Fortinet. One of the vectors included a vulnerability resolved by Fortinet in May of 2019. So more than a year before this. Um, allowed an unauthenticated attacker to download 40 OS system files through specially crafted HTTP resource requests as disclosed in, and then, you know, they, they link to their original disclosure. At the time of the disclosure, Fortinet made available patches for all supported releases, 5.4, 5.6, 6.0, and 6.2. Customers were notified at the time via the public PSIRT advisory system of the need to upgrade immediately and highlighted the same in the release notes. For those unable to upgrade, mitigations were provided. For additional transparency, this was again highlighted in a blog in August 2019 after the vulnerabilities were disclosed by the researchers at Black Hat 2019. So here we are. And today... This nearly now two-year-old issue is back in the news because Kaspersky Labs has just released their report analyzing a few high-profile ransomware attacks employing a relatively new strain of ransomware called Kring, C-R-I-N-G, which it, and it's well-designed. Uh, it uses AES uh, 256-bit uh, keyed encryption, and just for the heck of it, an 8,092-bit public key. Uh, it, you know, so public key crypto with overkill uh, bit length, because why not? Uh, it, these attacks, and Kring have been used to shut down some major European industrial enterprises. Kaspersky said... The attackers exploited the CVE 2018, so 2018, right, 13379 vulnerability to gain access to the enterprise's network. The vulnerability was used to extract the session file of the VPN gateway. The session file contains valuable information such as the username and the plain text password because... Absolutely. Let's, let's log the plain text password. What could be wrong with that? Unpatched FortiGate devices. On the other hand, you know, they, they maybe they know the magic key that that lets you log in without having the password. So there's that. They said unpatched FortiGate devices are vulnerable to a directory traversal attack, which allows an attacker to access system files on the FortiGate SSL VPN appliance. Specifically, an unauthenticated attacker can connect to the appliance through the internet and remotely access the file SSLVPN underscore web session, which contains the username and password stored in clear text. The vulnerability affects devices that run 40 OS versions 6 to 604, 563 to 567, and 546 to 5412. Several days, and this gets back to our point, Leo, uh, about surveillance first. They said, Kaspersky said, several days before the start of the main attack phase, the attackers performed test connections to the VPN gateway, apparently in order to check that the vulnerable version of the software was in use on the device. The attackers may have identified the vulnerable device themselves by scanning IP addresses. 
Alternatively, they may have bought, as in purchased, a ready-made list containing IP addresses of vulnerable FortiGate VPN gateway devices, because why not? In autumn, they said, in autumn 2020, an offer to buy a database of such devices appeared on a dark web forum. After gaining access to the first system on the enterprise network, the attackers downloaded the Mimikatz utility to that system. The utility was used to steal the account credentials of Windows users who had previously logged in to the compromised system. With the help of Mimikatz, the attackers were able to compromise the domain administrator account, after which they started distributing malware to other systems on the organization's network. They used the Cobalt Strike framework for that purpose. The Cobalt Strike module was loaded on attacked systems using PowerShell. So they have a much greater in-depth report. For anyone who's interested, I have the link in the show notes. And, you know, once upon a time, and we've talked about this before, Leo, as we old timers vividly recall, our systems, whether they were Windows, Mac, Unix, or Linux, crashed with some regularity. They don't any longer. And I'm really curious to see whether our use of networking and networking technologies will follow the same path. Are we ever going to get it right? Can we? One of the advantages our operating systems have is that everything is concentrated in one place. You know, they're, they're self-contained monoliths of technology. And even so, at the margins, our operating systems are still far from perfect. But on the Internet, everyone rolls their own. And everyone wants to. So as a consequence, we keep seeing the same mistakes being made over and over again. And we even see regressions where problems once fixed later reappear. And lessons once learned like don't use secret strings in firmware are forgotten or unlearned. You know, someone new comes along and thinks, I'm going to solve that problem this way even when many others before have learned the hard way not to. You know, on the Internet, there's no central control, which is often touted as being a good thing. It spurs and spawns innovation, and I'm sure that's true. But innovation brings mistakes. You know, the old adage, if you're not making mistakes, you're not trying hard enough, <laughs> is unfortunately all too true on the Internet. But collectively, we really cannot afford to keep making the same mistakes over and over. They're becoming more and more expensive as the Internet is becoming more and more core and, and, and critical. Um, and as our look at Pwn to Own is going to show, there are undoubtedly many that have not yet been found. You know, in, in this instance, it's certainly the case that many of the FortiGate SSL VPN gateways, I'm sure, 480,000 of them initially, I'm sure a bunch were quickly patched by IT professionals who were on, on top of their game. They received and read the news of an update, understood its significance, and quickly patched their enterprise's servers. Even if they have been, you know, may have briefly inconvenienced you know, some of their users in order to keep them safe. But we know that not everyone received the news. Or if they did, they received so much of it on a daily basis they, that they put it into the, I'll deal with this later pile and, and never got back to it. One thing we've seen is that there are technologies that seem to be particularly troublesome. Aside from embedding secret strings in firmware... There are web interfaces. They're attractive because they're so user-friendly. But they're also inherently attacker-friendly because their user-friendliness comes by way of complexity. And complexity is at an eternal war with security. So it appears 
that the best we can do is design our solutions to minimize our attack surfaces, like by using, as I said, one high security SSL server to provide all remote access by moving all other remote access to the inside. And of course, as we've often mentioned, being careful to keep all lines of communication open to all the vendors of our products and to carefully consider the implications of every security update notice we receive. You know, I, Lord knows how many of those uh, out of cycle, out of life, you know, all but dead Cisco plastic box low end routers. I mean, they're they're out there. They're on the net. Let's hope they don't have the web interface exposed. They are discoverable. They will be discovered. Um, and now that bad guys know there's a way in, uh, they'll take a look at, you know, I mean, you could buy one off eBay because, right, they're not going to have their firmware fixed. So buy one. And everyone knows it's there's lots of documentation on reverse engineering, you know, Soho router firmware and, uh, and find the problem. And wow, yeah. So the world we live in today, Leo. Well, let's just take a break and talk about <laughs> security. <laughs> uh, <laughs> our show today, and we'll be back with, of course, Poon to Hoon in just a little bit. Our show today uh, brought to you by the good folks at Worldwide Technology and, of course, uh, their partners, including the folks at Cisco are truly amazing. WWT offers security solutions and services that will protect your business. As you probably have gathered listening to this show, attackers have updated their strategy. The question is, have you updated your strategy? WWT is here to help your organization prepare and combat next-gen threats, the kind you hear on this show every single day. You want a company like WWT that's got the vision the services, most importantly, the capabilities to deliver security controls and reduce the risk for your organization. WWT does that. You talked about the, the competent IT person. Hmm. That's WWT. You need their team. They provide the resources and the platforms that make it all possible because they have three decades of experience. They have many customers who have been with them that whole time because they have a proven track record to, to help their customers succeed. And I have some great case studies. You can go to the site, actually, and check them out, wwt.com slash twit. Give you some ideas of the kinds of things WWT can do. It's hard in one commercial to explain the range of, of things they do. For instance, they worked with a large healthcare organization. Um, they wanted to, uh, to uh, make sure that their uh, electronic health record technology was secure. Of course, everybody's moving to electronic health records. WWT did a risk assessment used expert knowledge, state-of-the-art tools, in-depth analysis, skilled training and repetition with the staff to complete their assessment. Lo and behold, what do you think they learned? 90% of the vulnerabilities they found could have been fixed by putting in a comprehensive, systematic approach for patching. Exactly what you were just talking about. Uh, and of course, that healthcare company implemented it with the help of WWT. They worked with a retail bank. With uh, Their primary goal was different wasn't security in this case, but it, well, I guess it sort of was. They wanted to survive, you know, a big ransomware attack or some big cybersecurity event, preventing it and surviving it. WWT helped reduce system outages by 40% and ongoing cost savings of 48%, again, automating the infrastructure. WWT has a variety of solutions and security and services that will help you achieve more effective outcomes, whether it's risk management, endpoint security, network security, identity and access management, cloud security. This is kind of the point. They don't just do one thing. They do it all, and they have the expertise to do it all, and then give you a holistic solution. We always talk about security as a process of layers, but one company can implement them all for you and help you set this all up because they've got the knowledge, the expertise, they've got the capability. See how WWT and Cisco can protect your business assets and intellectual property with a holistic security approach. All you have to do is go to www.com slash twit to get started. Let worldwide technology help you. W wt.com slash twit let worldwide tech make a new world happen for you wwt.com slash twit 
You know, for something like security, I, I I completely agree. I think it makes so much sense because, you know, some things you really want to outsource because experience matters. Right. And right. and to be able to, 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 I mean, think of all of the knowledge they've, uh, they've accumulated right. from having done it before. You want somebody who's done it before. Right. You know, and if your in-house staff doesn't have the experience, then... You know, but they'll give it. they'll give your in house staff the experience. That's the other. Right. They, they do the handoff, and so that you are going to continue to operate. Right. You know, they're not there. I mean, they can, I guess they could be there forever, but really, their idea is to get you up on your own legs and on your own two feet, uh, yeah. doing it right. You know, whether it's CI/CD or Agile or DevOps, all of that stuff. That's that's their area of expertise. So it's nice to have a company that really knows what uh, what they're doing. All right, let's pwn it and own it. Ah, uh, so. <laughs> Uh, last week, of course, it was a virtual event, right? Because we're still in COVID right. land. Right. So, in a way, that's is, better because bad guys operate virtually, right? That's very good point. Right. So, last week, Tuesday through Thursday, one million two hundred and ten thousand dollars flowed from some generous, deep-pocketed sponsors to some very clever security researchers during what was the Spring 2021 Pwn to Own contest. Um, and the blow-by-blow -blow details are as interesting as ever. We'll get to those in a second. But overall, 23 teams of researchers targeted web browsers, virtualization offerings, servers, uh, and what was grouped as enterprise communications, <clears throat> Zoom among them, uh, the total prize pool, uh, most of which was distributed, was one and a half million dollars. So, as I said, one point two one million uh, went out in awards, uh, and there was a Tesla Model Three, but none of the teams chose to tackle the Tesla this year. Uh, but as we will see in a minute, they pretty well minced up Windows Ten. Microsoft Teams, Exchange Server, Ubuntu Desktop, Chrome, Edge, Safari, and the Parallel Parallels VM uh, desktop. And in addition to cash, which remains king, point scores, you know, the, the masters of Pwn point scores were also awarded for successful hacks. And the top three teams all tied uh, at 20 points each. Um, okay, so here's what happened. Uh, starting Tuesday morning, April 6th, at, uh, at um, 1000 hours, Jack Dates from RET2 Systems targeted Apple Safari uh, in the web browser category, obviously. Jack used an integer overflow in Safari and an, and an out-of-bands write to get kernel-level code execution. In doing so, he won $100,000 and 10 Master of Pwn points. An hour and a half later, here comes DevCore for the first of several. DevCore targets Microsoft Exchange, uh, of course, in the server category. Now, recall, as I reminded us already, that it was DevCore who originally discovered and reported the authentication bypass bugs in Exchange Server that led to this year's devastating proxy logon attacks when Microsoft appears to have badly underestimated their impact and took their time releasing patches. Well, lest we think that all of the problems with Exchange Server have been resolved we should think again. The DevCore team combined an authentication bypass, yes, another one, and a local privilege escalation to completely take over Exchange Server, pocketing $200,000 and 20 Master of Pwn points. And you know, <laughs> this time it's not difficult to imagine that Microsoft will be patching Exchange Server with some alacrity. Um, but since today, here on April uh, 13th, is April's Patch Tuesday, those fixes may not have been ready in time. I haven't even looked yet at what is happening today uh, uh, underneath us. Uh, we'll check that. We'll check into that next week. Uh, so maybe we'll see an out-of-cycle update. 
who knows? Certainly, they don't want to let a, an authentication bypass and, you know, complete remote code execution vulnerability languish in Exchange Server because, you know, <laughs> they're still being patched. Um, at 1,300 hours, the researcher who goes by OV targeted Microsoft Teams uh, in the enterprise communications category. He combined a pair of bugs to demonstrate code execution on Microsoft Teams and in doing so earned himself $200,000 and 20 points towards Master of Pwn. At 1430, Team Vitell took aim at Win10, uh, going for a local escalation of privilege. Uh, and they too succeeded with an integer overflow in Windows 10 to escalate their privilege from regular user to system privileges, earning them $40,000 and four points towards the master of Pwn. At 15.30 hours, the Star, team, the Star Labs team, consisting of Billy, Calvin, and Ramdan, targeted Parallel's desktop in virtualization. And this brought us the first failure of the first day. Uh, they were unable to get their exploit to work within the time allotted. At 16.30 hours, Ryota uh, Shiga of Flat Security, Inc. targeted a fully patched and up-to-date Ubuntu desktop, hoping to achieve an escalation of local privilege. Ryota used an out of bands, an, an, an out of band, or I'm sorry, out of bounds, I just have OOB here, out of bounds access bug to elevate himself from a standard user to root on Ubuntu desktop, earning himself a tidy, a tidy 30,000 and three master of pwn points uh, in his own pwn to own debut. He'd never done this before. At 1730, undaunted by their inability to penetrate the Parallels desktop previously, that Star Labs team of, Biddy, of, of Billy, Calvin, and Ramdan went after Oracle's virtual box. Unfortunately, they were unable to accomplish their penetration within the allotted time, and that ended day one. Starting at 9 in the morning on Wednesday, April 7th, Jack Dates, again, he, he returned from RET2 Systems. He kicked off the day, uh, much as he did on uh, the day before on Tuesday, this time targeting Parallel's desktop. Jack nailed it by combining three bugs, an uninitialized memory leak, a stack overflow, and an integer overflow to escape from the Parallel's desktop and execute code directly on the underlying OS. Jack added $40,000 to the $100,000 from the first day, racking up an additional four Master of Pwn points. So he's now at $140,000 so far. At $10,000 uh, or $1,000? Yeah, $1,000 hours. <laughs> uh, Bruno Keith and Nicholas Bumstark of Dataflow Security targeted Chrome and Edge. Of course, Edge uses the Chromium engine now, uh, and in the web browser category, they successfully employed a type mismatch bug to exploit the rendering engines in both Chrome and Edge. Of course, same engine, because of course, uh, you know, we're headed toward a web browser monoculture, for better or for worse. They earned $100,000 to, to, uh, in total, uh, and 10 Master of Pwn points. At 11.30, Team Vitell, they were back, uh, targeting Microsoft Exchange Server also, and scored a partial success, partial only due to a previous disclosure. They did successfully demonstrate their code execution on Exchange Server, but some of the bugs they used in their exploit chain had been previously reported in this contest. So probably a coincidental collision. Uh, this counts, therefore, as a partial win, but did award them seven and a half Master of Pwn points. At 1,300 hours, Don Cooper and Thias uh, 
Akmaid from CompuTest targeted Zoom Messenger, which we'll have a little more to say about later because it was significant. Uh, this was also in the enterprise communications category like Microsoft Teams. And this one made some news. They successfully used a three-bug chain to exploit Zoom Messenger and get code execution on the target system. Whoopsie. And this was without the target clicking anything. It's a zero-day, zero-click exploit, which earned them $200,000, 20 Master of Pwn points, and I'm sure a follow-up conversation with Zoom. Uh, at 1430... Uh, Tao Yan of Palo Alto Networks went after Windows 10. Uh, by using a race condition bug, Tao was able to successfully escalate his access to full system privilege on a fully patched Windows 10 machine. That earned him $40,000 and four points toward the master of Pwn. Uh, at 1530, uh, Sun Yu Park, who's apparently also known as Grigo Ritchie, was targeting Parallels desktop. And sure enough, by using a logic bug in Parallels, he was able to execute code on the underlying OS, basically breaking out of the VM container and earning himself $40,000 and four points. At 1630, Manfred Paul also targeted the Ubuntu desktop and achieved, or hoped to achieve, local escalation of privilege. By using an, an out-of-bounds access bug, he succeeded in escalating to root on Ubuntu desktop. So he's now $30,000 richer and scored himself three points. At 1730, researchers, the, the, the researcher known as Z3R09 targeted Windows 10, uh, with a local escalation of privilege attack, he successfully used an integer overflow, uh, escalating his permissions to NT Authority System account, which simultaneously escalated his bank account by $40,000 uh, and his master of pwnage by four. Uh, which brings us to the final day. Uh, also, at 900 hours, Benjamin McBride from L3 Harris Trenchant also targeted Parallels. Boy, that Parallels was a popular target this year. And Ben employed a memory corruption bug to successfully execute code on the host OS from within Parallels desktop, earning himself $40,000 and four master of pwn points. Um, at 10 hundred hours, Stephen Seely of Source Insight thought that Microsoft Exchange probably still presented some low-hanging fruit. Although Stephen did successfully use two unique bugs in his demonstration, he was only credited with a partial win because his attack required a man-in-the-middle aspect, so it wasn't solely one-sided, but it was great research, uh, and the judge awarded him seven and a half Master of Pwn points. At 11.30, Billy, operating solely from the Star Labs team, targeted Ubuntu Desktop. Although he was able to successfully escalate his privileges to root, the bug he used was already known to... Um, uh, he was targeting... Oh, yeah, Ubuntu. It was already known to Ubuntu and was on their patch list. So uh, Billy's demo of this earned him two additional Master of Pwn points, but that was it. At 12.30, um, Fabian Pergod of Synactive targeted Win 10. And despite Fabian's reported excellent use of ASCII art during his demonstration... I didn't see it. That's critical, uh, it turned, though. I, I think oh, got got to have <laughs> good ASCII points. art. Absolutely. And it uh, turns out he was aware, uh, Microsoft was aware of the bug he used, so he did earn two Master of Pwn points uh, for the partial win and, yes, for the ASCII art. It doesn't seem fair that because the company's aware of it, even if they haven't published it, you should lose points. I agree with you. And, and Leo, I, it also doesn't seem fair to me if there was a way to capture the exploits, like to capture them 
and escrow them, it doesn't seem fair if earlier in the in the same competition someone uses the one that you had. Right. Um, you know, you ought to share the the yeah, prize money. Yeah, there you money, go. That would be fair. Right. Yeah. Because because the sequence is just arbitrary. That you know the the because they're sequential, and in this case, on the next day, you might argue, oh, you know, the guy gleaned something from right. the demo. Right. You know, but you know, anyway. Uh, we have the first woman ever, Leo. At ever? 13, uh, yes. At 13.30, wow. Elisa Assage went after a Parallels desktop penetration despite her great demonstration and, yes, replete with ASCII art. The bug used by <laughs> Alyssa uh, had been reported to ZDI prior to the contest, which, as you said, Leo, I agree, shouldn't have counted against her. I but mean, if it's public, yeah. But if it's never been made public, hey, right. she found it on her own independently. Right. In this case, it reduced it to a partial win. The judges commented that it was great work and were thrilled that she broke ground as the first woman to participate as an independent researcher in Pwn to Own history. She took home a pair of Master of Pwn points, and let's hope we see her again. Um, at 1430, Vincent Dehors of Synactive targeted Ubuntu Desktop, uh, and despite Vincent's admission that this was his first exploit ever written for Linux, he had no issues escalating to root through a double free bug, thus earning himself $30,000 and three Master of Pwn points, and Ubuntu is the wiser for it. Uh, at 1530, uh, Da Lao took aim at Parallel's desktop, and using an out-of-bands write, he too successfully completed a guest-to-host escape in Parallel's, earning himself $40,000 and four points to toward the Master of Pwn. And at 1630, last but not least, Marcin Wazowski targeted Windows 10 for a local escalation. He nailed it using a use-after-free flaw to escalate his Windows 10 privilege to system, taking home $40,000 and four Master of Pwn points. So, a bunch of high-profile companies uh, have some high-profile patching to do. Uh, you know, and, and every Pwn to Own where we watch Talented researchers, uh, you know, research hackers, essentially, appear to so easily find and exploit previously unknown flaws. You know, these are all true zero-day exploits when they're demonstrated. It always gives me a bit of a chill. And it really begs the question, you know, just how much other unknown stuff lies out there, either undiscovered or worse, previously discovered and being put to quiet use. You know, we don't know what Zerodium's portfolio looks like today. And <laughs> I'm not sure I want to know. Um, you know, and uh, I said I would mention these uh, a little more about these newly revealed Zoom vulnerabilities, uh, which were demonstrated by the team from CompuTest Security. Um, theirs is particularly noteworthy because they require no interaction of the victim or from the victim, other than being a participant on a Zoom call. What's more, it affects both Windows and Mac versions of the app, though it's not clear whether Android and iOS may also be vulnerable. It doesn't uh, For affect the web version of the app either. Oh, okay, yeah. right. Yep. Fortunately, details of the flaws have not been disclosed, but in a statement sharing the findings, CompuTest said that uh, they were they were able to almost completely take over the system and perform actions such as turning on the camera, turning on the microphone, reading emails, checking the screen, and downloading the browser history. So, sounds more like a brow like an escape to browser uh, sort of thing based on what they're doing. Like, reading emails, well, maybe Yahoo and Gmail, you know, but maybe not yeah. uh, emails outside. If, if the browser's sandboxed, they can't get outside of that. Although, right. it does beg, okay, now let's find a sandbox escape. <laughs> We're on our way. Right. 
Uh, for its part, Zoom has said that it already pushed a server-side change to patch the bugs. And noted that it's also working on incorporating extra pr protections to resolve some security shortcomings. A Zoom spokesperson said on April 9th, we released a server-side update that defends against the attack demonstrated at Pwn to Own against Zoom chat. This update does not require any action by our users. Again, that suggests yes, it's the web only. That way, when you like, like when you bring up a new web instance, you're gonna because they said it was a server side update, right? So it's gonna push out the new client side stuff to that web, you know, chat instance. And they said uh, this update does not require any action by our users. We are continuing to work on additional mitigations to fully address the underlying issues. So it sounds like they pushed an immediate short-term but incomplete fix to block the explicit attack or the explicit vulnerability that had been found and demonstrated uh, and that it revealed some need for some deeper re-engineering, which they're going to follow up and do. Uh, Zoom said it's not aware of any evidence of active exploitation by these issues, while pointing out the flaws don't impact in-session chat in Zoom meetings. So it's only just Zoom chat. And they did say the attack can only be executed by an external contact that the target has previously accepted or this part of this target's same organizational account. So in any event, Pwn to Own is clearly providing a valuable service. And I hope that for what it's worth, those in charge of security everywhere, you know, sense this, get the same feeling of chill that I do uh, when they watch what talented researchers uh, are able to do with some of the industry's presumably most secure offerings. It's like, uh, you know, pay us enough money and we'll take a hard look at your product and uh, you know, find a way in. And so you have to imagine that there are people elsewhere uh, being motivated either by money or prestige or, you know, their government. Who knows? Um, anyway, we're not going to run out of content anytime soon on this <laughs> podcast, Leo. And the point of point own, as you said, is is to get these exploits into the hands of the people who can fix them. Yes. And that's where the money comes from, which is probably why something they already know about isn't worth very much because, well, we already know that. We're not going to pay right. for it. They, they don't want to pay yeah. for that one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's really an important thing. And it's great that, uh, you know, people can make a living. Uh, and some of them very, a very good living if you're really skilled at it, uh, finding these exploits. We need that. You know, that's yeah. one of the solutions to what you were talking about. You know, can we ever live in an exploit-free world? Um, which is, as you say, highly unlikely, thank goodness. <laughs> At least get us to episode 999. That's all we're they, asking. They, uh, the world is going to keep screwing <laughs> around with this stuff. And, oh. <laughs> Steve Gibson, always a pleasure. You'll find Steve's uh, wor life work, Spinrite, the world's best hard drive, uh, actually shouldn't say hard drive, any disk, SSD too, uh, maintenance and recovery utility, really works with SSDs, which is such good news. That's the new Spinrite 6.1. That's going to be great. You can get Spinrite 6 right now at grc.com, and you'll get a free upgrade to 6.1 when it's out. Plus, you get to participate in the development of 6.1, which is ongoing and active, right? No honeymoon, right? <laughs> Uh, no, no, okay. we didn't. We, uh, okay. we. But I think we actually went back to work that evening. Oh uh, my yeah. God! I'm so, not surprised. <laughs> you got to do what you love, man. Yeah. Uh, so, so get that spin right. GRC.com. While you're there, of course, you can get a copy of this show, 16 kilobit. Steve has uh, two unique versions of it: a 16 kilobit version for people with not a lot of bandwidth. He also has a uh, very nicely written, because it's written by a human being, Elaine Ferris, transcripts. So you can read along as you listen. That's all at grc.com. He also has a 64-kilobit audio version. We have audio and video at our website, twit.tv slash sn for security now. While you're there, you'll see there's a bunch of buttons at the top of the page, including the YouTube page. So you can click there and subscribe there if you want or find a podcast application. Click one of those buttons, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, etc., etc. Podcasts. Uh, subscribe there. Do us a favor, leave a review uh, if you're subscribing. Uh, let everybody else know what a great show, secure and must-listen security 
now is. We do the show every Tuesday around about, it's roughly 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Eastern, 20.30 UTC. If you want to watch us live, there's a live audio and video stream at twit.tv slash live. If you're watching live, chat live at irc.twit.tv. There's also a synchronous communications available. Uh, Steve has a great forum at his website, grc.com. Is it grc.com slash forums? Uh, uh, um, yeah, GRC, uh, forums .grc. Forums. Oh, the old school. That's the best way to do it. I like uh, that. Yeah, sub, sub, subdomain. Forums.grc.com. We have our own forums at www.twit.community. We also have a Mastodon instance. It's kind of an open source federated Twitter clone at twit.social. More than a thousand Twit listeners in there now, which is which is really great. We love having you on both those platforms. Um, and if you will want to follow Steve on Twitter, he's at sggrc. His uh, DMs are open, so you can leave questions there or at the website, grc.com slash feedback. Might be a little late next week. I don't think so. Apple's got its event at 10 a.m. Pacific. Uh. Mac Break right. Weekly will follow immediately after. I suspect we'll will be uh, they want, you know they're going to do an hour. They're they're very disciplined now that they pre-record these, so I think we'll not be late. But just a word of warning. Thank you, Steve. Have a wonderful evening with your honey. Thanks, we'll you, buddy. We'll see you next week on Security Now. I'll be doing exactly that. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that podcast episode. If you would like to check out more about tech news, then you should check out Tech News Weekly with me, Micah Sargent, my co-host, Jason Howell, where we interview the people making and breaking the tech news every week. Security.